Well, hello and welcome everybody to um, this OpenShiftCommons.gov SIG talk. Um, it's one of the series of briefings that we do every week, and um, this is the kickoff for the .gov special interest group. So we're really pleased today to have Jason Calloway, who's been working on the OpenShift Compliance Guide and has been working with a number of customers and deployments in the federal government sector on PRISMA compliance, and he's going to share with us the work that they've done to create the Compliance Guide and open up a conversation with the rest of you about maybe contributing to that. So without any further ado, um, Jason, take it away. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. So let's just dive in. You know, um, Normally, when I think about compliance, the first thing that comes to mind is driver's licenses and sitting in the DMV, because it, that is also sort of a, a form of a, a risk management framework. And um, it, it's a useful analogy, because none of us like it. Uh, none of us really like going to the DMV. But at the same time, I don't think our lives get better by getting rid of uh, driver's licenses and just uh, letting anybody do it. So. It's uh, sort of an unpleasant thing, uh, but a necessary thing. And with, it's a little bit uh, more than that for those of us that work uh, with the US government because it's actually the law. There's uh, this thing called uh, FISMA that came in uh, this uh, yeah, e-government act in 2002. So you can actually look that up and find it in the United States code. And it has sort of a... Um, a spaghetti chart of implications. So uh, FISMA has been amended a bunch of times from the original uh, act that was passed in 2002. It identifies various federal agencies that are responsible for implementing and enforcing this stuff. NIST is really uh, the main one that we typically think about and they've published a number of different special publications. Uh, sorry about that, that, uh, that affect that. Um, Sorry about that. Okay, so apparently I have I'm not able to mute my phone. That's awesome. Okay, so we have the the risk management framework itself that comes from uh, NIST Special Publication 837. We've got uh, template SSPs uh, that you can use. Good grief! Hang on one one moment. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. Uh, and then FIPS 199 itself um, uh, describes how to actually implement that risk framework. The security controls that get implemented come from this monster document called uh, 853, in this special publication, 853. And that's got a total of about 1,500 individual security controls. Um, and then there are some other um, uh, guides that you might have to comply with. Uh, such as uh, FIPS 140-2 uh, that uh, does a lot with um, which crypto algorithms uh, you're able to use, and it has a certification process, and we can talk about how uh, Red Hat technologies comply with that. The, um, the way that you typically automate these things is with uh, a, an umbrella of technologies from NIST called SCAP for the Security Content Automation Protocol. We have an open source implementation of many of those standards uh, that come from OpenSCAP. Uh, we have another project called the SCAP Security Guide that has a bunch of uh, XCCDF profiles to implement things like the STIG, which is itself an interesting bit of uh, dependencies there. So the SSG actually is upstream of the US government configuration uh, baseline USGCB, which informs the STIG that is published by DISA, and that's um, a coordination effort uh, with several different agencies there. If you're working in DOD or in the intelligence community, there are still separate uh, authorities that you have to worry about. And um, then there's the, the some terminology that's changing. Um, what we used to call it the certification and accreditation process. Uh, that that document's been uh, deprecated in favor of a new risk management framework. It's called ANA now for assessment and authorization. So it's a big mess. And typically a barrier to being able to get on with doing the work that you wanted to do. So normally in this process, you create a great big spreadsheet of all these different security controls. You down select that to the ones that apply to you because there are numerous non-technical controls uh, in here. And NIST deliberately did not label controls as technical or non-technical 
because depending on your project, you may have a technical way of implementing that and you might not. So it's designed to be very flexible. But the implication of that is that it puts more work on uh, the end user who's actually writing the uh, system security plan and taking that body of evidence through the ANA process. Gosh, I apologize about the, uh, the phone there. Okay, so um, moving on, we have uh, published this OpenShift compliance guide that uh, is sort of this is sort of a very new effort and it's not uh it's not typically done um normally and in, in fact if you look at the the fed ramp uh document which is um sort of around good grief um, very sorry hang on one moment we, we love when mom's called Hey, I, I'm I'm doing a briefing. I gotta go. Terribly sorry about that. So we've taken a lot of the uh, the work here to um, th that we've put into doing this uh, ANA process several times, um, and we've we've open sourced that. Uh, we we want to uh, be able to get some uh, some reuse out of this because we find that we've we've done this a number of times and we're constantly uh, going through that same work. So while this is sometimes done in sort of a sensitive environment where the body of evidence itself may be um, may be classified um, uh, or just or just sensitive, we've taken those things that we're able to share, we've open sourced it and we've we've put it out in sort of a framework that we think will be, um, a little bit easier to uh, to scale and collaborate. And we call that the OpenShift Compliance Guide. This is actually hosted off of GitHub. The, um, the visual interface here is done with something called Read the Docs, which is a really cool tool uh, that we can dive into a little bit more. And let's sort of break down what we have in these different sections here. The reference architecture is really important. And when you're going through the ANA process, one of the uh, kind of primary things that you have to uh, get through is just educating your creditors on what it is that you're trying to do. Uh, and particularly with um, new technologies like containerization, uh, that can be a challenge. You know, we, we went through this whole thing once before with virtualization, and there were many um, sort of learning curve moments there where previously, but before that, every single information system, as an example, was physical, and had um, a barcode on it, an asset tag, and could be tracked as an asset. So once virtualization became a thing and it wasn't possible to put a physical barcode on a virtual machine, uh, that tripped up a lot of people in that uh, older CNA process. So now with containers, again, there's more to learn about. So having a reference architecture and this CONOPS, this concept of operations, prefab is going to help you get through that process more quickly. The SCTM, the Security Control Traceability Matrix itself, is the core of this whole project. That's actually a very large spreadsheet, which is sort of our, our canonical source of truth. Because while you uh, generate a, um, a, a body of evidence and a system security plan, and it's all nicely formatted, every time I've done this, it, it really comes down to sitting with your accreditors, having a spreadsheet up on a, on a projector, and going through the things that they care about line by line. So that's why we made that sort of the, the core of the project. That spreadsheet gets uh, parsed and we procedurally generate um, the what you see on the Read the Docs website. And that's handy because you can just send somebody a PDF of that um, if you want to sort of uh, jumpstart that process. But the, the spreadsheet is what you're gonna end up at anyway. In that spreadsheet, we identify who is responsible for implementing a particular control. So uh, in some cases, um, it might be a physical access control, a non-technical control that we sometimes refer to as the guys with guns controls. So that's gonna be your, your physical security officers that are uh, being sure that only authorized people are actually able to uh, get into the building where your information systems are hosted. Typically, you know, that's not an open shift thing, that, that's somebody else. So there are different roles of, of people who implement these things. The customer responsibility matrix makes it very clear 
uh, what an OpenShift consumer has to implement in their SSP. And then we've done a lot to automate this uh, with Ansible and we're well down the road to being able to sort of have a turnkey um, press button, get reference architecture deployment. We'll talk about that. We're not quite there yet and we'd really appreciate help from the community. So just to go over this reference architecture a bit, we did this based on Amazon Web Services uh, because that's where we've done a number of these uh, OpenShift 3 deployments now, and um, uh, it's it's what we knew. It doesn't uh, need Amazon. This could work on any infrastructure. And because OpenShift uh, runs on top of RHEL and uses uh, Docker and Kubernetes, all it requires is RHEL. So that means we could be doing this on uh, VMware. It could be on top of OpenStack. Um, Azure now. So there's very many options. It's just that for this one, we happen to use Amazon as a reference architecture. Uh, we would like to generalize that, but we didn't have uh, the time to make it really general, so we stuck with what we knew. So we have here a very conceptual diagram of all the different components that go into this. So this is something handy that you can give to your accrediting engineers uh, to kind of review what that architecture looks like. And then we have a more uh, um, kind of a more abstract view here of the different uh, system types and how those interact. All of this is in the, the compliance guide, uh, by the way, but I, I thought it might be a little bit easier to go through slides. So this one is, um, this one is a pretty important one. A lot of times you'll spend um, a considerable amount of effort documenting the data flows uh, that, that go into your whole project. That's done for you here down to the port level um, and uh, identifying which, um, which system types require different ports and how that data flow works. We also have um, a conceptual diagram of how the build process goes uh, for when you actually spin up an app. And this, this becomes really important when you're dealing with folks that might not be familiar with OpenShift or just straight up might not be familiar with uh, how Docker and Open Container Image Format works. So being able to show them this and how uh, you take application code from a Git repo, and then that gets uh, pulled into our source to image or S2I process, uh, then that will create an app image and stick that into the integrated registry. Um, this kind of helps uh, break down that, that knowledge barrier uh, to be able to get to this. Now, when it comes to um, how you actually implement FISMA compliance, there are baseline controls around um, what we call the CIA triad. And that doesn't mean uh, typically what you think it means. Uh, it's not in this case referring to the Central Intelligence Agency, but rather uh, three different types of um, areas of concern around confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Each one of those has uh, a baseline low, moderate, and high setting. And we designed this guide to help you achieve a FISMA high deployment. Now, as you might imagine, um, having high ratings for uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability uh, is more difficult to achieve than simply a moderate setting. And one of the things that you have to worry about at high is encryption at rest and in transit of your storage. So this became sort of a more complicated thing uh, than we thought it would be uh, when we set out to do this work. Because one of the things that OpenShift offers you is persistent um, persistent storage uh, through the, the PV and uh, persistent volume and persistent volume claim process within, within Kubernetes. So how do you scale that and how do you get encryption at rest and in transit there? And there were a number of ways that we could have hacked this. Uh, and we ended up deciding on this architecture because it gave us the best balance of bang for your buck with your underlying compute resources, in this case, Amazon EBS volumes, and then um, uh, where we were actually doing the Lux encryption. And uh, one more note here, um, we wanted to use Lux because it, it comes out of the box uh, with RHEL. Um, it, it's a free to use tool. Uh, some uh, government agencies have a preferred provider of uh, storage encryption. So if you have some other other thing that you've got to use, you could certainly uh, sort of uh, plug and play there and use something other than Lux. Uh, that's just what, we're, what we chose here in this particular uh, architecture. Uh, before we go on to kind of digging more into the controls, do we have any questions in chat uh, about the reference architecture? 
We've got um, one question um, from Sean Wells on the data flow side. Do you have anything that shows where the encryption is being used for node to node and internal to external communications yet? That's a great question. We, I don't think we have that documented, but that's something that we should uh, capture. So this brings up an excellent point. Um, when, when you're looking at this guide and if you find that it doesn't have something that you would find to be useful uh, when you're going through the, the, uh, your ANA process, um, let's just open an issue on, on GitHub. You know, this is an open source project and we have uh, the opportunity to collaborate here. So that's a great opportunity to open a GitHub issue so that we can uh, uh, get that into the guide. Or if, uh, if you wanna make it really easy, you could simply uh, write that in yourself and issue a pull request. We'd love that even more. Yeah. And so the, the, only, the only other question so far is um, they were looking for labels for each of the slides for um, there. But I, what I was going to say is if you go to the OpenShift Compliance Guide, read the docs page that the URL is in there, you can find almost all of these um, images that he's using in that, I think, or all of them are in that guide at some point, and I'll try and, and cross-reference them when we post the, um, the video next week. But yeah, other than that, sure. you're, you're, motoring, you're, you're motoring right along. Um, do, you have, great. do you have a URL for the GitHub repo for our issue requests? Um, uh, sure do. So if you use our tiny URL that we had back here earlier, um, OCPCG for OpenShift um, uh, Container Platform Compliance Guide, in the upper right there, there's an edit on GitHub link. So that'll take you directly to uh, the page for, for that, um, that particular section that you're looking at. And then anywhere from there, you can just click on the issues tab to be brought to that. Okay. Yeah, I'll just pop that. I have that link and I'll pop it in now. So if you wanna go motor on a little bit more. Um, Excellent. Continue. Okay, so given the guide as it stands today, this is the breakdown of controls and who's responsible for what. So of the total of about 1,500 controls in NIST 853, um, we find that about 660 of those are technical controls, um, or at least controls that may be of interest to an accreditor who's going through uh, your body of evidence. In some cases, uh, like with the guys with guns controls, typically they don't even bring that up. Uh, so that's that might not even be uh, of interest. Um, but for other things uh, like um, uh, passwords on, on the BIOS for the underlying uh, host system, uh, that will fall into um, you know, whatever IaaS you're using. So in this case, we're using Amazon EC2. Um, that's something that they handle and they probably have their own SSP for that. Uh, so we hand that off, uh, we inherit that control. So this is the breakdown, an OpenShift consumer or a tenant in this landlord tenant model then would be responsible for tracking 73 controls, whereas if they were um, say running OpenStack, uh, uh, running their own OpenStack and building their own uh, applications in there, they'd be responsible for everything up to and including that IaaS layer. In the security control section, we're missing some things. And we, we've got a couple janky workarounds right now. Ultimately, they need to become uh, RFEs uh, and get upstreamed into uh, open storage and make it into the enterprise grade product. Um, the way that uh, we, we work around some of these things uh, is sometimes, as I said, uh, a little bit weird. One example would be the way that we do security banners. So uh, there's no easy way in the OpenShift tool right now to add some kind of security banner saying like, um, you know, secret classification at the top of it. Uh, the way that we get around that is we just wrap the web console in a little bit of JavaScript that uh, adds like a 10 pixel banner at the top that has the proper color and the right stuff in it. Uh, and then we resize an iframe to actually hold all of the, the real uh, web console. Um, in this particular case, uh, we have this um, already written and we're going through a downgrade process to be able to um, make that unclassified and put that into the compliance guide itself. Uh, if uh, sometimes that, that, that can take a while, depending upon how motivated uh, our government uh, sponsors are to actually get it done, we could just rewrite it. So this is um, an example of one place that we don't yet have what we need in the guide. Uh, we have some sections that, um, that still need some work. 
And this would be one of them, actually being able to add that security banner. Uh, Sean and I had a great conversation last night about a, a couple of these other uh, requirements. And one would be, uh, one example would be like the um, notice and consent click through uh, that you typically have to uh, use when you when you're in one of these environments. Uh, so that uh, you know, normally when you log into an environment, you you have this uh, say a DoD warning banner um, where you agree to monitoring and and uh, you you promise that you're not going to misuse the thing and you hit OK to accept. Um, in many cases, you're able to inherit that control from the uh, workstation baseline for the agency where you sit. Uh, many of them have um, uh, workstations that that government agency manages. Uh, they have um, they have a their own set of click throughs so uh, we found that um, we're typically able to uh, inherit that control. Uh, that's another thing that is not well documented in the guide yet, and is something that we have to go through and, and make a little bit more explicit. So there's a number of places where uh, we have the opportunity to collaborate here with the community um, and uh, get that discussion rolling. The customer responsibility matrix, like I was saying earlier, um, is of interest to uh, OpenShift consumers. And there's a couple different uh, sort of use cases for this guide. One would be where uh, you're um, hosting your own OpenShift environment. So you host, you host it, you run it, and then you consume the services. So in that case, uh, the, um, the group going through that any process would be responsible for both the landlord and the tenant set of controls. If this is in a um, uh, in a container as a service sort of context, where um, where you uh, you're just consuming that service and someone else is managing it, then you'd be responsible for those tenant controls. So uh, that's sort of the assumption that we made with this guide. That in most cases, um, it's going to be one group that's hosting it for um, many other um, customer organizations uh, within that agency. Um, and that's the bit from the customer responsibility matrix that you'd like to give out uh, and make it easier for your, um, your sort of uh, meta customers there uh, to be able to um, have a, a very clear picture of what it is that they need to do in order to become accredited when using, uh, when using this guide. And a, like one example of that then would be the control RA3, which is the risk assessment. You have to do that on a per um, sort of a per program basis. So um, this is this actually brings up uh, an interesting frequently asked question, which is, um, does this guide mean that OpenShift is accredited out of the box? And that's, that's a no. Um, you can never pre-accredit software. Uh, what we're trying to do with this is lower the barriers to entry to get to that accreditation. And um, uh, we're, we're going to get better at that over time. But it shouldn't be thought of as uh, I hand this guide in and that, and that means that we're, uh, this product itself comes pre-accredited somehow. That's just not the way it works. Now I mentioned before, uh, any questions on that much before we move on to the Ansible stuff? There was um, one question, uh, Sean tried, I think answered it um, here. Um, Jonathan was asking, by inherit this control for click-through, just to be clear, you mean that because users already have click-through on the workstation used to access OpenShift, you don't need to need it in the OCP console? Absolutely correct, yep. And then Jonathan's asking, any timeline or version target for official FISMA baseline? Oh no, that's always a good question. Huh. Um, not well, yet. Yeah, yeah. That we, uh, I'll get to that when we when we get to the end. I've got a couple other uh, facts that we can get through. So uh, with the Ansible stuff, um, we're we're trying to automate as much of this as possible uh, and and make it repeatable. And this uh, further lowers those barriers to becoming accredited when you do this yourself. Uh, this is sort of a just a temporary placeholder until we get this to a more uh, permanent location. But on Ansible Galaxy, we have uh, an org that is sort of a roll-up of many of our uh, standard roles that we've used to implement these things. Um, just a, a quick overview. Ansible is a, um, a sort of a Python and YAML-based uh, configuration management and automation framework. Um, it's very, very easy to use. You just write these YAML playbooks that describe what it is that you're trying to do although you could write your own Python-based modules if you wanted to. 
And we'll look a little bit more at what some of these look like. Um, but we've been using these to um, to make this uh, a little bit easier, a little bit more repeatable, and particularly to give to our um, our users who may not be super familiar with the tool, uh, so that they can uh, implement it more quickly. And actually, OpenShift itself, its its deployment mechanism, uh, uses Ansible. So with um, with Ansible itself, roles give you sort of a pluggable way of taking a set of playbooks and all of their associated variables and, and even libraries that they require uh, and make it easy to plug those into the playbook that you're writing. So we've broken many of these things up into roles, um, like the 853 uh, role, for example, implements many of those uh, controls at like a rel level uh, that you have to get through in order to be compliant uh, with, with all the controls that you see in this guide. Um, that's just sort of um, a nice to have, and it, it's non-official. The official way to uh, scan for, and um, we're working on the implementation side there of that, uh, is with Open SCAP and the SCAP Security Guide. Um, we we publish a lot of that stuff, and and Sean is uh, very very plugged into that, and uh, I'm sure would be happy to talk in depth about any uh, SCAP stuff or SCAP Security Guide stuff, which might even be an appropriate. Um, uh, follow-up uh, briefing for the next time we do this uh, .gov um, uh, stuff. So the 853 role is there. Um, uh, the link will be in the slides for when we send that out if you'd like to play with it. That's broken up in such a way that it's kind of easy for admins to understand what's going on and then, and then make some changes. So this is an example of some of the uh, default variables that are set in this role. And we deliberately made it um, sort of admin centric as opposed to compliance centric. Um, so as an example, if you look at line 12 there with the shared library path, um, that's very obvious what it's talking about. It doesn't uh, tie that back to some arcane control that then you've got to dig for to see what that means. So this makes it a little bit easier to achieve that accreditation um, uh, to implement those controls. Uh, so that's that's part of how we've been doing this. Uh, here's another here's another example. We we've broken the different tasks down into control family. So in the access control one, um, you can see here uh, an enable SE Linux um, uh, control, and then which uh, well um, play, and then which controls there's actually tie back to that. One of the nice things about this design is using the tags uh, system. You can specify by CIA low, moderate, or high, uh, what controls you actually want to implement. So at runtime, you could say, I want uh, confidentiality uh, high, integrity high, availability moderate, and then it would, it would tailor it to only um, apply those different controls. All of this goes into sort of uh, a larger effort that we've been going through to create a way to make it really easy to reproduce fully disconnected deployments of OpenShift. So what, what does disconnected mean in this context? When you, um, when you typically deploy OpenShift on a, a system that has connectivity to the internet, you've got a lot of um, resources there available to you that you might not have in a fully air-gapped environment. Uh, you can register your system with the uh, Red Hat uh, content delivery network. Um, you can pull your your RPMs down simply by uh, enabling those repos and running uh, the the various prerequisite commands, and then the deployment Ansible playbook. Um, you, if you have to um, pull down any additional uh, Docker images that uh, that you might not have locally, you can go out and get those from the Red Hat registry or from some other registry. Doing these things when you have no ability to hit the internet. Um, makes uh, deployment very, very challenging. So the goal of this um, effort was to not just come up with a way to implement that reference architecture in the security con op, but also to make it easier to, for one thing, practice doing those disconnected deployments because you actually learn a lot just in um, going through it once in say like a private VPC like we're doing here in this, uh, in this project. Uh, and then you can take all of those deployment artifacts that you, you pull down into your uh, Bastion uh, VPC there, tar those up, bring them across your air gap, and have a much easier time successfully deploying that on your disconnected environment. So th that's what we're doing there. If, uh, if we were to describe the, um, 
the compliance guide, and, and this is not, none of this is actually official. So, but if we were to think of the compliance guide as sort of being a, a, at a beta degree of maturity, this OpenShift disconnected effort would still sort of be an alpha. Um, there are a couple issues that we have um, not quite tracked down yet, just due to time constraint uh, around the deployment not completing, uh, particularly like with the HA proxy load balancer. So we have some opportunity for uh, collaboration and improvement there. Um, but in the long term, I think this is going to be one of the easier ways to actually achieve those disconnected deployments. Oh, um, we've got a couple typical questions that I want to hit, but before we move on, uh, any questions about the Ansible stuff? Uh, Sean is, is saying that he really, really loves the disconnected install scripts, and he's asking, any plans to work with OpenShift product management to formally incorporate and add support for disconnected installs? Absolutely, yes. So the goal for all of these, so we'll, that, that segues nicely. So f these are the four most common questions that I encounter when, when talking about this stuff. Um, and uh, you know, is it official? And the answer is not yet. This is something that was born out of the public sector group uh, within Red Hat. Uh, sort of, uh, it came from the field with a lot of deployments that we've done um, we're trying to sort of get it to a point where it, other people are going to be able to understand it. And then, like we're doing now, we're sort of opening that up more to the community so that we can get it to a usable state and get that uh, incorporated upstream. So our goal would be to get this compliance guide hosted off of the official docs.openshift.com and docs.redhat.com sites. Um, but it's not official yet, and there's a lot of work that we need to do to be able to get there nor is it complete. Um, like I was saying earlier, we're missing many different implementations, uh, such as the, um, the security banner. And um, we as a community sort of need to decide how we want to approach that. Do we want to continue with that janky JavaScript window? Probably not. We probably want to get RFEs open so that it's a parameterized value within the OpenShift tool itself, where you can specify, I want to have a banner of this height and color with this content. Um, and one thing to always bear in mind is no matter how official or accurate we can make this guide, it never ever makes OpenShift accredited, you know, air quote, out of the box. You have to have um, a sponsor program, you have to have uh, your own um, system security plan and, and your full body of evidence that you put through that ANA process. It is a per program, per effort uh, type thing uh, that simply cannot be generalized at the product level. Um, but what we can do is help help you get through that more quickly uh, and help you educate your accreditors so that um, they're more comfortable getting through that. And we wanted to do this in an open source way because we're a 100% open source company. If, uh, like I was saying earlier with the FedRAMP um, uh, SSP template, it comes pre-populated with headers and footers that say um, uh, company proprietary trade secret type stuff. And typically, that's how um, this type of data is, is handled. Uh, a company might put some effort into making it easier to get through accreditation. Uh, but that then becomes some more secret sauce to entice you to use that product. Um, that's just not how Red Hat rolls. We wanted to do this in a fully open source way. Um, and I, I think everybody's going to benefit from that. Any other questions? No. Um... Though I, we might unmute Sean and let him talk a little bit too. He's adding some commentary here. So let me just find Sean in the list of people. There we go. Sean, if you unmute yourself, you should be able to talk. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I don't know what I can add. Jason's doing really great work. On the uh, accredited out of the box thing, one of the, one of the things we're trying to do with Red Hat marketing uh, as well as within public sector is create kind of this government ready concept where using rel seven as the example, uh, we ship government paper, like the accreditation paperwork. So all of the control mappings, Jason showed that spreadsheet thing, all of the implementation guidance. And the idea is to start going through regulated baselines like the STIG, uh, which is for DOD, BISMA, which is largely for civilian. Um, and actually ship gov government ready deployments or government ready reference architectures. And kind of what Jason's done is set us up for success to do that for OpenShift. 
perfect. All right. Jason, do you have any more slides tucked up your sleeve there? I do not, but ah. thank you very much for the opportunity to share this. I'm, I'm really looking forward to more community involvement here. We've already had a couple folks from some of our agencies uh, provide a, a little bit here and there. Um, but when we uh, when we approach this in the open source way, I think it's going to make this easier for everybody. Yeah. Well, I, I also liked your suggestion that maybe having um, a follow up on open scap um, would be a good thing as well. Plus, um, once we get this up and out onto the, the blog site and other people want to put comments on it, if you want to host another one to review the issues list um, and have a conversation about that as part of the OpenShift Commons GovSig. Um, I'd be happy to do that to try, help drive drive through this in that in that shape and get some community feedback on it. So if anyone's on this call um, that it has further things that they'd like to see in this um, guide, um, please do um, pull an issue or contribute something, make a pull request, um, and create the content, and, and we'll try and get that out there and in, into this guide as well and, and give you a place to have conversations about it here in the, the GovSig. I'm looking to see if there's any more questions, if you enter them into the chat. Um, we, hopefully, um, Jonathan's saying that hopefully he can contribute to it in the future. We hope you all will too. So Jason, um, it doesn't look like there's any more questions. And Sean, um, thank you very much for doing this session. Um, it's, Hopefully this work will get incorporated into the uh, product management um, workflow and, and get out there in a relatively short time. So thanks again, Jason, and I look forward to having you guys on again to do OpenSCAP. Thanks, Diane. Take care, guys.